Okay. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of After Impact. I am your host, Tom Bilyeu, and I'm here with none other than Agent Smith. Mr. Bilyeu. What is up, dude? How you doing? I'm doing well, man. Thank good. you. Good. How about you? I'm good. It's another are Thursday. Are you? You're yeah. not going to tell people about your Mucinex? Well, uh, I'm good battle? now because I just got, I'm, I'm over You're it. You're hopped like, up? Like, I woke up this morning, I, I'm, I think I'm over the cold. Okay. So no more Mucinex for you today. No, I didn't We're take done. it yesterday Pass either, up. but I still had a lingering cough. Okay. I haven't really been coughing, so I'm feeling good. Nice. All yeah. right. Spent, a, spent about a week sick. But, well you know. done. Well, tell us a little bit about what it's like to be on vacation and to get sick literally on the flight. Like you could yeah. feel it coming on on the yeah. flight. So I was taking a red eye, which is already oh. terrible. Trying to sleep and um, was I could just feel it coming on. I could feel yeah. it coming on. And then once we landed in New York at 7.30 a.m. or whatever, I was like, yeah, I'm sick. It, this is happening. So I went to the hotel, mm -hmm. tried to sleep it off a little bit. And then, you know, there was a lot of, we were going for a wedding, so I had to see a bunch of people. Yeah. Also wanted to meet with family and stuff that was there, so just powered through. I just, just took some medicine and just powered through and Ouch. tried to make the best of it, you know, because you're in New York. What are you going to yeah. do? And yeah. I still had a good time. All right. All things considered, had a good time. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll count that as a win then. Yeah. I'll go oh, back, okay. but soon. It's a must. Yeah. New York is amazing. Yeah. yeah. But not as amazing as Layla Ali. That's like true. That way to bring, yeah, great, that way to bring nice. us back. Yeah. It was subtle. Layla Ali is amazing. Um, for those of you who haven't watched the episode or don't know who she is, she's the daughter of Muhammad Ali, yep. the uh, you know, world famous boxer. She, in her own right, is a world champion, world famous boxer. 24 wins, 24 and 0, undefeated. Yes. Uh, 21 knockouts of, the, of those wins, which is, in, is pretty impressive. Very. Um, not only that, but she has gone on to have so much success in her career. She's been a TV host for various shows. She was on Dancing with the Stars, came in third. Um, she's an author, she's a speaker, and she's just doing a lot of different things. Um, but all of that success, was uh, it wasn't guaranteed. And She started out as a very rebellious teenager, had a lot of trouble yeah. in her family life, at school, with her friends, got thrown into juvie for a while. Yeah. Um, and then sort of turned her own, her, turned her life around. But even before she was a boxer, she owned her own nail salon at the age of 18, which is very impressive. Very impressive. So there's a lot to dig in here. If you haven't seen the episode, you got to check it out or listen to it on the podcast, which you can find iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever you prefer. But this is a fun one, definitely to go into the champion's mindset and to learn about someone, you know, who not only has built an amazing career, but did it sort of in spite of having these obstacles. And I think one of the obstacles, if we could start there, is um, having famous parents or having yeah. a famous parent. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think about that? Honestly, until I read her book, I don't think I had great insight into how difficult that could be. And you really have to separate out her as a boxer from growing up with famous parents. And the reason that I say that is... She didn't even know female boxing existed right. until she was 18, I think. Um, so it's not like, oh, she grew up to, you know, the daughter of a famous boxer, and it was just sort of everybody assumed you're right. going to become a fighter. Like sparring at the age of four. Yeah. Like, there wasn't any of that. None of it. <laughs> nothing. So first of all, she didn't even really grow up with her dad. So her yeah. parents divorced when she was like seven or eight, something like that, and already had a tumultuous relationship with um, both of her parents, much more so with her dad. Um, was very much sort of a mama's girl. And then when her parents divorced, her mom got into an emotionally abusive relationship, which then caused her to withdraw. And mom basically posted her and her sister up in the guest house because the new guy that she had gotten with really was trying to isolate her from the kids. And so in her own words, she raised herself, had no intention of becoming a boxer, had no intention of following in either of her parents' footsteps and um, was rebelling hardcore. The reason she wanted the nail salon was to um, really, uh, she tried to get emancipated. She asked yeah. her mom to emancipate her, wanted to be her, her own person, didn't want to take money, nothing, just really wanted to carve her own existence. And then one night happened to be at a friend's house when her the friend's dad put on a Mike Tyson fight and one of the opening fights was female boxing. And she said in an instant, cause she had been street fighting. Yeah. Not like, you know, not like Kimbo slice, right. but you know, street fighting, like but, somebody gets in your face mm -hmm. and you, it goes to fisticuffs. <laughs> uh, so she would, you know, throw down was a pretty tough chick and 
So when she saw that, she thought, whoa, all this anger that I have pent up inside me, like that, this could be a great outlet. So that's sort of why you have to separate those two things. You can't really think of it as um, what she ends up doing is in any way, shape or form really being related to um, the fact that she had a famous father who was a boxer. So she hated fame in the beginning and really felt like it was fake. And her portrayal of like growing up in Beverly Hills is like... It's so crazy because it is the cliche of like all these hanger honors, yeah. people that just want to be near her dad. So people are being nice to her because of who her dad is. And just like the, she really seemed to have an early sensitivity to to that and to the like sycophants and, and really, and really. And she tried to escape that too. It's yeah. a, she says in the episode, she says, I would go into the hood to learn how to do nails. Like I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to go be around different people, mm. and which is which is fascinating to me too. It's yeah, like, very. So yeah, didn't I? I think more and more, especially now with the level of success that I've had, hearing other people like the Jim Carrey quote, I think gets it all. I wish everybody could be rich and famous so you could see that money and fame don't solve anything. Yeah. So it's like. It, it, it's so true. Like they're very powerful things, but if you're not using them for something very specific or you're not a good judge of character, um, or if it came too early in your life, you know, for me, like the really nice thing about having money now is I didn't come from money. So, yeah. and having to fight and really like transform who I am to be able to have that kind of success. It's like you, a, you, you have a totally different perspective on it and B you like you I still, to this day, identify way more with sort of um, that edge between white and blue collar Tacoma than I do with Beverly Hills. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I want to remind everyone, or actually welcome everyone from Facebook Live. We are recording this live for you to get involved in the conversation of After Impact, which is the show where Tom and I go deep into the episode of Impact Theory and discuss the guests and some of the ideas. So this is a chance for you to ask questions, for you to join the conversation. We encourage you to do that. Put them in the comments and we will get to them. Um, if you're on podcast or watching this on YouTube, join us on Facebook Live if you can one day. Yes, please. 10 a.m. Pacific do. time, usually on Wednesdays. Today we're doing it on Thursdays because we had a, a big day yesterday. We did, we did. And hopefully you guys are following me on Instagram. You would have gotten the behind the scenes look at who we are filming, I'm sure there's someone in the comments that'll drop it in for us. We got some of those deep core impactivists that are especially impact subs in here. They know what's up. Yeah. Those guys know what's up. It's so a big one. We'll it's let you guys soon. be the reveal. But yeah, that was a lot of fun. And we had back-to-back -back monsters like yeah. in the house. So uh, Tuesday was madness around here. So first of all, because of our partnership with Vayner Talent, we had just a, an army of people here on Tuesday being followed by Bloomberg, who want to see what Vayner Talent's all about, yeah. what we're up to. Um, the house is just jam-packed. And then, and then, that goes into the secret project that I'm working on that I really hope we're going to be able to pull off by this summer. That would be amazing. And if Dr. Finesse were here, I'd be staring at him right now. Um, <laughs> We've got a secret project underway that really, really, while it's a slow burn, it's a long play for um, people in our ecosystem, it would be these really punctuated, amazing things, which is part of a much bigger plan for me, um, but that I'm super, super jazzed about. And then Wednesday um, was, was awesome. And so we've just had, the house has been chock full of people. It's been so, so cool to have that kind of energy and everything here. It's been really, really neat. So yes. some fun things uh, cooking Ooh, off camera here. A lot of energy. Speaking of energy, we got shout outs in the comments. What's up, Isar Azim from Sweden? Nice. How you doing? What's up, Sweden? Uh, Jihad Boon Mausa, I'm gonna butcher that. We got that. that, no, that's exactly how it's from said. just like From that. Morocco. Whoa. What's up, Morocco? All right. Uh, Anna Mena from Berlin. Anna we know Mena. Anna. And uh, Samina from India. Awesome. We're going global today. We are going global today. And you know that each and every one of those names, I want to spend like three or four minutes just freaking out about how cool they are. But I'm trying to temper that shit so it doesn't get too ridiculous. Yes. But I don't know what my fascination is with such unique names. I think growing up in Tacoma, everybody was named like Steve, <laughs> Tom, yeah, yeah. Brian. Yep. So like now. Right. There's a whole world of names yeah, out like there. Like Impact Love Theory it. is uh, Mr. Worldwide. So That's right. It's all good. All right, let's um let's let's keep talking about Layla's upbringing. So, one of the things I found really interesting in her story was that she said she wasn't 
you know, she wanted to get emancipated. She wanted to go on and do big things. This is around age 16, 17. Um, and she specifically says, I wasn't going to wait for anyone to give me permission or to give me the support I needed. So she wasn't waiting for her mom to drive her somewhere. Right. She just jumped on the, the, the bus, the yeah. city bus, and took it across town, all the way to the other side of town, to go to her nail school and learn that. So just, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that kind of mindset that she had early on. Well, so it goes to like some people are moving towards something. Some people are moving away from something. And mm -hmm. I think probably until she found boxing, she was moving away from something. She was moving away from the home life that she didn't like. She was moving away from the abusive dynamic of her mom and her boyfriend. She yeah. was moving away from um, being told what to do by other people. And that's why I think there was such a big shift for her when she found boxing because it was the first time she was moving towards something. She was going to work to become, you know, a boxer. Like even the nail thing, and I'm guessing because she hasn't continued to pursue it, that um, that wasn't like a passion. She just, it was something she was interested in. She thought she could monetize it. Yeah. And so she, you know, was leveraging that to get away from the other things. And understanding that there are times where you can leverage moving towards, but there's also times that you can leverage moving away. And yesterday's guest, and I'm so pissed that I didn't follow up, and he went on to something else that was equally interesting, but when um, yesterday's guest <laughs> mentioned, and I'm not even sure it's why I'm being secret, secretive yeah. about it. We should but, just tell him. All right. Should we tell him? We finally had Gary Vee on the show. Gary Vaynerchuk. It was awesome. It was, that interview is unlike anything he's ever done. I agree. It, it, even he, like, in the middle of the episode, like, multiple times was like, hey, this is interesting. Yeah. Um, so the, he talked about the darkness. And so he's like, I fucking hate Michael Jordan. Like, all this, yeah. like, nothing but uh, hatred for the poor man. And, but he said, but he is motivated by the darkness. And so that was something that I think Gary tapped into. That is something very much Leila Lee tapped into in a big way. That darkness inside you, that anger, that frustration. And being able to channel it in a productive way you see incredible things happen. And in no uncertain terms, she was able to channel it incredibly powerfully. And you see that in her boxing career. But watching her like set aside what happens, she gets in trouble with Juvenile Hall and all that. But I mean, she found herself pretty early, like 18 is pretty early to really get your shit yeah, together. And yeah. so while when you're reading her book, you sort of go through it in real time, it seems like she struggles for a very, very, very long time. But in truth, like really gets to get gets it together by 18, learns how to channel that anger, learns how to channel her frustration um, in making herself physically strong. But seeing that mental toughness develop is really, really incredible. And it it begs a question of nature versus nurture. So I did not consider myself mentally tough when I was a kid. And I think that was my nature. Like by nature, I don't think I'm very mentally mm. tough. And the reason that I am so, I am such like a convert to that things can be developed through uh, nurture, that you can learn this stuff, is because I did it. Like, yeah, I transformed yeah. myself. And seeing her, I think she had an early win with mental toughness, and, but what she parlayed that into, and then how she had to leverage, like, because anyone's gonna say, well, part of the reason she was good at boxing is nature, and I think that's fair enough. But the reason she became a champion is because of nurture. It was the willingness to work, and put it in, and change, yep. and transform, and learn, and grow, and get better. So it's very, very interesting. It's interesting that you draw parallels to her, Gary, uh, Michael Jordan, because she, like Michael Jordan, had an amazing moment in her career where she had the flu and she yeah. was fighting. And uh, talk about that a little bit. So what, what's really important to me about that story is she didn't tell anyone. Yeah. And not for years and years and years after the fact. In fact, I think it was, um, I think, God, the first time she mentioned it might have been in the book. So she has the flu. She's like a really, really famous fight. And I think it was the Frazier fight. Yeah. So she's, Jackie Frazier. Yeah. So yeah. she's fighting Jackie Frazier, which one of Muhammad Ali's biggest fights was against her father, Joe Frazier. Mm -hmm. Joe Frazier? Yeah, Joe Frazier. And so this is like a huge fight for her. She feels like she has something, obviously, to prove in this fight. And she goes in, and she said, I had been really um, sort of dismissive of Jackie. I didn't think she was taking boxing seriously. I get into the ring with her, and I realize, holy hell, like, this woman's actually really tough. And Layla refused to sit down between rounds because she was so sick that she was like, if I sit down, I won't get back up. So she stayed, right? It's yeah. amazing. Stays standing, 
ends up winning the fight, decisive victory, um, doesn't knock her out, which she later says is one of the biggest regrets of her life, so that she didn't do a rematch so that she could actually knock her out, but that's a, a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, but that, like, the fact that she didn't tell anyone was because she didn't want to make excuses. She didn't want to say, oh, I didn't knock her out, I had the flu, right? She just let it be. It is what it is. I didn't put her down. That's like, I'm not going to make But she still wins the it. match, which is amazing. It gives you a window into her mindset. It's like, that upsets her that she didn't knock her out. Right. She won the match, but she didn't knock her out. <laughs> and What's happening? So if we could make that stop, Chase, that would be amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> one, of, one of the downsides of uh, continuing the podcast during the remodel is sometimes people don't realize they can't remodel it's true. from 10 to 11. It's true. So We should have an us. on-air sign yes. when, you walk, that would in, just be when cool, you walk into the like, house. Yeah. For no reason, but uh, also for that would be useful. All right. We have an awesome question from our Facebook Live audience, from our dear friend and impactivist, Mike Burkhart. Nice. Very active, Mike. Um, he says, do you need darkness? Do you need anger? Can you accomplish the same goals without it? This is a good question. Um, I'll say no. <laughs> I, okay. I, I'll say you can't accomplish the same thing without it. So You can't accomplish you cannot, the same thing, but you do you need it? Yeah, I think you do need it. Okay. So um, I think that there are going to be times where the beauty fails you and it's just not enough. And there are so many um, things in your life that will be beautiful. Like laying in bed in the morning is beautiful. It feels amazing. Like chemically your body is, hasn't flushed the, the neurochemistry out. So you don't want to get out of bed. It's very warm. At least for me, I'm laying next to like the center of my universe, my beautiful wife. Like it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's in moments like that where I have to click over to the people who want me to fail, the people who have doubted me, um, like all of the like dark things inside of me to get me out of bed and get me going. And otherwise, like, I, I just, I really believe there are times where the beauty is going to fail you. And it, so it's a motivator then. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like there's no other reason. The darkness will do nothing for you other than in my opinion, give you energy when you're really suffering. Because when you're really suffering, like they've just done studies on this. It's like, and the study goes exactly like this because I even I'm trying to do less of that. There are studies, but not say what they are. Yeah. They fucking make you stick your hand in a bucket of ice and at first whatever, but then it really starts to fucking hurt. Yeah. And what they found is people can go like something like three times as long. It's ridiculous. It's not three times, but it's a lot more if you let them swear and get angry. Huh. So when like you bring that, it, this is how I think people have to look at themselves. We have gotten to this point through evolution. So all the emotions that you have, the fact that we send signals through the amygdala to process emotions, the fact that it goes through the deep limbic system to ask, is this good or bad? The fact that pain and suffering are separate, like there are reasons that this stuff is structured like this. Anger is not an accident. It is not a throwaway. It has a purpose. And that purpose is, dude, if, if someone is the perfect example for me, if you are going after my wife, I will fucking ruin you, okay? I will ruin you, and that's not me. Like, I'm not a, like, ruin you kind of guy. Like, yeah. I like to look at the beautiful things. I wanna help people, and I, it doesn't even trigger that. If you're coming after me, I can't click over into the same anger. Like, it's too, I just get it. I get why people yeah. do that. I, uh, like, I feel bad for them, but y if you go after my wife, like, I'll click over into that zone. And so from a make sure my, I don't have kids, but make sure my kids are okay, make sure my wife is okay, from an evolutionary perspective to protect what's yours, to, to actually become enraged if someone's trying to attack them. And then that the result of that would be that you're tougher, you don't feel as much pain. It just makes sense. And can we derail for a second? Yeah, let's derail. Do you know what rabies actually does to you? No. This is crazy. So people guess that... Um, the mythology of zombies is entirely rabies, and that what that is is, you know, rabies would sweep through an area. Mm -hmm. So rabies uh, gets in your brain, it takes control of a couple things. It makes you hyper aggressive, mm -hmm. it makes you totally dead to pain, and it makes you wanna bite. Sound like anything? <laughs> Like okay. a zombie. Right? Yeah. Exactly like yeah. a zombie. Now, why does it make you want to bite? Because that's how it's going to pass on to the other person. You need to get the saliva into the bloodstream, so you've got to break the skin to get to the blood. Yeah. Okay, so biting, pretty damn good way to do it. If you were just scratching, you're not necessarily going to transfer the virus or bacteria. I'm actually not sure if it's a virus or bacteria. I think it's a virus. It's a virus. I think. Um, so 
it's got to make you aggressive so that you're going after them. It has to make you want to bite so that you do that. And then it has to deaden you to pain because obviously if the person is trying to hammer you back that, you know, right. you, you, you can't persist. be stopped. Like yeah. you've got to keep persisting. So when you see those things, like for humans to pass on their genes, you need something that in the moment allows you to click over and just have more endurance, more tenacity, more whatever. And that is why, I mean, you know my current obsession with Goggins. Like, <laughs> dude, that guy's ability to harness anger and rage and the darkness is perhaps unparalleled in today's world. I, I have not heard of anybody in all of my travels that is able to do what he's able to do with the darkness. Mm. So to bring it back to Leila Ali, like, or to Mike's question, I think if you take someone who has beauty, right, but no ability to click over into anger, to rage, mm -hmm. to leverage that, they will lose every time to the person who has beauty and rage. I'm just a big believer it's an 80-20 split. And, and there is something so... how do you so get it? Let's say you don't, that you don't identify with that. You're all positivity, all beauty. How do you get the darkness? Don't. What do you look for? Nothing. Why would you want it? So what happens is you're making a, a fundamental assumption that it is better to achieve and be ambitious than to not. The question was, can you achieve as much without it? No. Do you need to? What if you want to? You just feel like you don't have that in you. I think that's probably good. I think you may have dodged a bullet. Okay. I, I don't have a strong stance on that. I've never thought about going to get the darkness. God, it just right now, right here, because I don't pass moral judgment on whether somebody should be ambitious or not, I think it takes all kinds. Like if your life is 100% full of beauty, it sounds fucking amazing. Wait, but are you saying that you can't be ambitious if you don't have the darkness? No, I'm saying you won't accomplish, you won't as, accomplish much as much as somebody who has the ambition, has the beauty, and has the right amount of darkness. Because if you have too much darkness, it will consume you. Darth Vader. Yeah. yeah. So, and here's a, even that is probably, no, that's real. There are people that are that dark and accomplish a lot. But I really, really believe that the darkness ultimately is corrosive, that it takes in a way that beauty doesn't take. Like, I think that if you, like, when I think about how prolonged I can pursue beauty, it's really long. And I can get other people excited. Like, it's how often. You're really fucking honest, so you'll actually answer this honestly and maybe give me an insight. How often do I leverage with the team? How often do I try to rally people around rage and anger? Very seldomly. Right? Like yeah. super rare. That's certainly how it feels to me. But r oftentimes, I'm trying to rally people around. This is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to build. It would be fucking amazing. We're incredible. We can yeah, do this. Yeah. Right? So the balance to me is super critical. You've got to spend the vast majority, 80%, of your time on the beautiful stuff, no more than 20%. Because like when you're over here, like I start to get a headache, I start to like really fry out. Like if you're spending too much time in that, it's, it's maybe higher in terms of peak exertion, but whoa, what it takes is pretty extreme. Yeah. Well, that was, that was fun. That, that, was, was, that was a good segment right something. there. Um, <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's jump to another question here. And let me just remind everyone, since we're about 25 minutes in, welcome, if you're just joining us, to Facebook Live. This is After Impact, the show where Tom and I talk about impact theory, the show. We go deep. Yes, That's what we do. Indeed we do. And today we're talking about Layla Ali, who is, a, one who is incredible. Yeah, she's, she's really just impressive and... Um, uh, also, I would not want to tangle with her. No, she's, for real. You can see it in her eye. Yeah, first of all, she's 5'10", so she is not like a yeah. super petite woman. And then second, yeah, she, she is a trained boxer. So I watched some of her, I was watching a highlight reel, and mm -hmm. she, is just, she just mauls people. Devastating. Yeah, it's crazy. She is not for play. Um, all right, I have a question for you. So Layla has said that, so you actually commented on this, that she's both a confident person, but also very open and, and that this can be a model. So how do you think that people can achieve the balance of sort of vulnerability and confidence? I actually think the willingness to be vulnerable comes from confidence. Oh. So if somebody wanted to be vulnerable, I would say first get really fucking confident. Yeah. Confidence comes from competence. So get good at something. Yep. So like Leila Ali has talked about this. I'm not good at everything, but when it came to boxing, you just weren't going to beat me. 
And I love, I think her ability to admit that she's not good at like a lot of things comes from that place of strength of knowing like, I really did get good at this. I really gave it my all, I did something. Um, and when you know, like it's, it gets really easy to be vulnerable when you know if this person uses this against me, it's not gonna hurt me because I'm at peace with that. Mm. I'm at peace with the things that I'm not good at. So if you try to throw it back at me, um, I'm not building my self-esteem around it, first of all, you know what I mean? So it's like, if you, where people get themselves in trouble is when they're hyper-selectively vulnerable with somebody because there is some part of you that wants to confess, like, I'm not good at that. Yeah. And you do it with somebody you think you can trust, but you are so raw about it that you know that person could hurt you if they throw it back at you, and then they do. Mm. That's the one that really fucks with people, and so have you seen that happen? I mean, you've course, managed so many of people, course, of course. So the the most beautiful thing to I actually think I talked about this in the episode, but this is like long before the episode. One of the most beautiful things I think a human being can do to really experience life is to have been vulnerable with somebody, to really share with them, to be hurt by that, and be willing to do it again. Mm. Like knowing I'm probably going to be hurt by this. But to, to never open yourself up to somebody is, is to miss the real beauty of human connection. Because the, I think the fantasy human connection is where you are 100% known and seen for the things you're good at, the things you're bad at, and everything in between. And to be accepted and loved, right? That, there's nothing more intoxicating than that. Yeah. That for me is the purpose of marriage. And if your marriage isn't giving you that, I, I honestly don't understand why you're doing it because marriage comes all kinds of sacrifices. So it's like, if you get that, there, there's nothing else. Like there's nothing greater than that. So whatever you're hoping to get from life, that's the highest thing. To have somebody in your life, it doesn't have to be a romantic attachment, but to have somebody in your life that gives you that. They know you, they see you, they know exactly who you are, the good, the bad, everything in between. Right. And they love you, man. They just love you. And they accept you for who you are. It's fucking beautiful. It's amazing. And so the easiest way to get to that is to have the confidence in who you are, to build your self-esteem around something that's anti-fragile so that even if somebody's like, hey, you're bad at this, you're like, yeah, no, I totally get that. I want to learn. I want to mm -hmm. grow. I want to get better. But I'm not building my self-esteem around being good at that. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, if Layla Ali is building her self-esteem around being good at boxing, she's fucked because 20 years from now, it's just not possible. She's right. always gonna have to harken back to, I was good at boxing, right? right. So to, to build your self-esteem around something like that, which has to do with, say, physical prowess, is just, it's a dangerous game. Mm -hmm. So to find something that really is anti-fragile, to be able to open yourself up, um, to know that some people inevitably are gonna throw it back at you, and that um, it's just a good reminder to build your self-esteem around something that is anti-fragile yeah and she actually i think her understanding of that is from her sense that nobody is perfect and she talks about this pretty eloquently in the episode mm -hmm. um where she says that even the people who are extraordinary at certain things like her father who is an extraordinary boxer or other people who are capable of great things are far from perfect and right. they may be good in that realm but they're have many flaws in, in other areas and that's sort of very comforting it seems like for her that that understanding of people yeah i mean it's uh, it's comforting for me yeah is it not comforting no for you? it is it is for sure right because so <clears throat> there's a line in a rap song and I, next time i hear it i need to write it down and remember who it was no it's not a rap song it's just a song it's on like top hits today on spotify um <laughs> and, but i don't know by who and the guy said um Part of living is making mistakes, but it's also trying to be great. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yes. Like, people have gotten so into the culture of it's okay to make mistakes that they forget the second part, which is, but those mistakes should be in service of trying to be great. Mm -hmm. Like, trying to really fucking do something with your life. Like, something extraordinary. Not everybody's going to want that. I get it. But, like, for the people that are prepared to really eke the potential out of life, like, man, you should be really striving for something just wildly exceptional. But in that, to know that you're probably never going to get great at everything, that you're yeah. going to have foibles, that there's going to be parts of your personality that just are ridiculous. Like, we literally were having sort of a semi-company meeting this morning about there are just things I forget about. It's crazy. Like, 
first of all, to all the impact subs out there, this is a good reminder. I really do write the, um, the newsletters because it didn't go out today because I fucking forgot to write it um, <laughs> despite being reminded yesterday. And it's, yeah, yeah I, I haven't yet addressed that. And I really, and part of the reason I haven't addressed it is I'm, this is so fixed mindset of me. I'm not convinced I can fix it. Whoa. I know. I know. So I got to have to work on that. What I'm going to do with that. Yeah. Because damn. Yeah. Um, All right. Let's kick it over to our Facebook live audience. So this question is from Mr. Cabrera, who um, has been in the comments a lot. Uh, I know that we mispronounce your first name, so that's why I'm calling you Mr. Cabrera. (laughs) And I know that at one point you phonetically spelled it out. And uh, yeah. What is it? Jumani. 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 We used to call Literally. you Jumane. Oh, it's Jumani. This is the guy Jumani. from Tacoma. Yeah. Yeah. Jumani, my boy. There it is. So we will correct that and get it right next time. Jumani. Thank you. Uh, he says, Agent Smith and Tom, the breakdown duo. My question stems uh, from what Layla Ali said. Not everyone has the same hunger and tenacity. She understood that her son didn't have the tenacity she possessed, but that he had strong leadership qualities. How do you go about seeing someone's potential and learning how to guide them forward? Good question. Jumani, is this because you have kids? I need a little more context. I'll make some up. Let's, let's, let's put it in the context of um, employees managing people. Okay. Um, so one, I always start with asking, what are your goals? So I don't want to impose my goals on anybody. Mm -hmm. And I'm beginning, you'll notice in the 25 bullet points, which now actually are up thanks to the lovely and talented. Oh my God, have we introduced Molly yet? No. Molly, come Molly, get out here. So our intern army continues to grow, which is amazing. I would bring Ibrahim on as well, but he's actually the one live switching right now, right? Yeah, he's backstage. So yeah, he, he went deep. Come on. Uh, you want to stand right here, but you kind of have no, to duck down a little bit. Yeah. yeah, otherwise you're a floating torso. Hi, Impactivists. I'm Molly. I'm the newest marketing intern, and we are so excited to have the 25 Bullets live on the website right now. On the blog. Find it. Go check that out under the blog. There um, it is. It's titled Impact Theory 25 Bullets. So check that out. Let us know what you think. Boom. And I saw Ibrahim snuck up here. Come on in. Say, you're really going to have to like squat uh-huh. down a little bit. This, this man is not short. That is no. the easiest way to say that. Hey, what's up, guys? Just happy to be here and hoping to make an impact on your guys' life. There awesome. Well, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Ibrahim. All right, so those are live now, and I started that because why? Oh, because um, employees' goals, yep. uh, how to help somebody. So, yeah, I start by asking people what their goals are, mm-hmm. um, and you'll notice that in the bullet points, some of the language that I'm beginning to try out is like, Being a linchpin. I always used to tell people to be an entrepreneur. And it was like, not everybody wants that. Yeah. So, in fact, I'll say that once, if people were really to live as an actual entrepreneur, the number of people who would enjoy it is probably far less than 10%. So, now I've switched, be a linchpin. I'm going to say this. I don't even want to be around people from a business perspective. If you don't want to be a linchpin, I literally... I don't understand. Mm. That's somebody who's literally saying, like, I'm not trying to, like, optimize myself. Because I don't understand them, I'm not judging them, I'm not saying they're bad people, I just, uh, you want to talk about not having anything in common, I will seem so crazy to them. Yeah. So, I'm looking for lynchmans. I'm looking for people that are like, I only get one go around at this, I want to get as good as I can at whatever I'm going to do. I was having a weird internal moment earlier today where I'm like playing this dialogue in my head and I was like, I don't care if like what you want to do is clean floors, fucking clean those floors, man. Like take pride in what you do. Mm. Take pride in what you do. Like I'll, I do not understand. If you don't do something like to get good at it, to really like shine, to to be proud of that shit. Like what are you doing? Mm. What are you doing? I don't understand. So anyway, Jumani. Yes. Jumani, I would need to understand like what is the goal? So I would bring an employee in and say, okay, what are you trying to accomplish? Now here's where I, I am actually firing my prefrontal cortex to not bite the microphone, which I'll never understand wow. why that like urge expresses itself in biting. It might be rabies. Might Wait, be rabies. rabies yeah. It might be rabies. <laughs> That's a very good point. Uh, like most people don't know. They don't know what they want. Yeah. 
And most people that think they know what they want are pacifying themselves with, I want to help people. <sighs> How do you want to help people? And if you just want to help people a little bit on the weekends, then awesome, like we can give that advice. But if you want, like somebody wrote to me today and said, I want to help um, a million people over the next two years. Cool, that's awesome. But how? Do right? what? Because yeah. if you want to help that many people, first of all, now we have to scale. This isn't one-on-one -on -one stuff. This isn't nights and weekends. This is like, I'm committing my life to helping a million people over the next two years. So. Also, now it's like two years of your time, like you've got to eat somehow, so like what's the plan to monetize that? So people need to learn to get hyper-specific. But let's pretend that that person came in and they gave me incredibly specific answers. They knew exactly what they wanted to do. Now we just work backwards. And honestly, one of the last things I'm going to get to is the, the, you know, the tenacity, the grit, the whatever, because there's so many just practical concrete steps and things that they need to do. And then at some point, they'll either catch fire for it and find that it's a real passion. And then that passion is gonna be the foundational element to grit, okay? Because if you don't have passion, if you don't have that energy and enthusiasm, you're just gonna change and change and change. You're gonna pivot. That's not, oh, I don't wanna do that anymore. I wanna mm. do this. Oh, no, I don't wanna do that. So it's like normally people are caught up in the the sort of falling in love phase, right? And you may be mm -hmm. falling into, I'm gonna be an engineer. No, I'm gonna be a soccer player. No, I'm gonna be a musician. Like what they're really doing is they're falling in love with the initial excitement before the learning process gets boring. Yeah. Because it's, it's not the hard, man. It's really not the hard. It's the boring. It's the like, I have to do this again. It's like when I think about writing, writing is hard for me. There's nothing facile about it. Yeah. Nothing. Yep. So... When I'm prepping for um, one of the impact theory interviews, I love the research. Research is easy for me because it, it triggers innate excitement. Mm -hmm. I'm learning something new. I have so much fun with that, like super easy. But then when I have to write the intro, I know it's gonna be hard. And so I like put it off and put, one more video would help, like one more article, that, that would really help. <laughs> and um, so it always ends up, invariably, I get a text from Casey about five minutes before I'm supposed to be on set, where she's like, hey, I need the copy for the teleprompter. And I'm like, fuck, like I'm still writing it because I've put it off, put it off, mm -hmm, put it off, mm -hmm. put it off. So it's my ability to push through that part, the hard part, like it's, it's not physically taxing. So when I say hard like that, I don't mean it's not like the long hours -y part because the long hours, the physically draining, all that, that's easy to do um, when you're excited, mm -hmm. but the boring part of like having to rewrite that sentence like 30 times and face my inadequacies and like that's <laughs> where it sucks. And so that like you're so deep in the process by then, it's like the passion of what you're trying to create is really gonna be the thing that carries you across. So that's such a long answer to this question, but it really is get to the highly tactical first, worry about the sort of interpersonal emotional stuff second. Like you gotta see where they're falling apart. Yeah. Will almost certainly be boredom, which will be overcome largely by having a vision of what you wanna become, what you're trying to accomplish. So to Layla Ali's point about her son, that he doesn't necessarily have the tenacity, but he's a good leader. The honest answer is if he doesn't develop the tenacity, he'll never be able to lead. That's the hard truth. So oh, at some is. point, like you, <clears throat> you have to develop it. I like it. I like uh, two things from this episode. So you said confidence is the foundation to vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. And passion is the foundation to grit. Yeah, I like that. All, both true. All right, um, here's another question. This is, she talked about choosing the one thing to double down on. And this is a question I had too, so this is great. Any guidance on going from knowing what you want to do and planning for it to overcoming the hesitation that comes from fear of needing more preparation and just executing. Basically, how do you know when to stop planning and start executing? Just fucking do it. Just Jared, start executing. Everything else is an excuse. Everything. So, um, it's all one big lie you're telling yourself. So if you, you'll never learn faster, then you'll learn by trying to execute something. So they say the best way to learn something is to teach it. Why? 
because you think you understand it until you have to go explain it to somebody else and you realize, whoa, I actually don't understand this. But now you know exactly what you don't understand because as you try to put the words around, you realize I need to go research right. that, right? So when, like whatever your vision is, um, I want, like this is perfect. I want to help starving children in Africa. Rad. Do you know what your first step is? This is, this is such bad advice because I'm forcing you just to fail right away, but it is the best advice you're ever going to get because if you did this, if you have the cojones to do this, you will leapfrog everyone. You want to help starving children in Africa. The first step, book a flight to Africa, period. Second step, get a hotel. That's probably good. Third step, what village are you going to? Right. That's what an reason? awesome step. And then just and don't book the trip for six months from now. Book the trip for this weekend. Get off the plane, be hopelessly lost, totally confused, probably um, have something bad or at least stupid happen to you. Um, lose your wallet, run out of money, um, who knows? Or maybe you stumble upon something amazing, somebody who can help you. Like, if I were going to do it, that's not what I would do. But for somebody who thinks that acting, like how do I get over the hesitation? It is the one thing where there is no other answer than look inward, change your identity to be the person who acts immediately. Say, I am the type of person who acts immediately. So if I want to help starving children in Africa, I'm going to book a ticket right now. Like, then live up to that. If you do that, all of the other problems in your life will fade away to nothing because you will go there, you will realize what a stupid mistake it was to go unprepared, but you will have acted. And so the one thing that you're telling me is actually your stumbling block, you will get over that. And if you're smart, once, if it's, let's say it's Thursday and your flight leaves tomorrow, the first thing I'm gonna do is start researching, okay, where's the area I'm going? Has anybody else done anything there? Because I'm gonna be in a full-blown state of panic because I know that this is coming whether I want it to or not, right? So I love putting that gun to my head. That's why, like, dude, I tell people what we're up to. I push people to get it done fast. Like, the best example of what it is like to be an entrepreneur is to jump off a cliff with a parachute on your back and try to build an airplane on the way down. Now, I say have the parachute on your back. There's no reason to do something that's going to kill you. But that, hey, see if you can figure it out, because that's what it feels like. But it's the people that never jump. They're just never going to build that thing as fast as the people who are willing to take the risk, because now you're literally falling. And it's like, well, I better figure something out. Otherwise, I've got to pull the ripcord and admit that this didn't work. Mm. So, but if you, uh, like, stop planning. Go out and do something. Like, there's nothing more powerful than that. You will figure things out as you go along, or you will learn something about yourself, which is that, what are you going to learn? I know what you're going to learn. You're going to learn that you're scared. You're going to learn that you're not smart enough. You're going to learn that you're not capable enough. You're going to learn a whole host of very negative things. And if in that moment you realize the absolute crushing necessity to switch your identity to that of the learner and to begin building your self-esteem around identifying the right answer faster than anyone else, always being willing to act, always being willing to stare nakedly at your inadequacies and address them through the acquisition of skills. Like, if you do that, everything in your life will change. So it's like, I don't know what magic answer people want. Like, fucking fumble your way through life. Just go, fall on your face, get back up. Like, none of it matters. What is the worst, the worst thing that could happen to you is you die, yes? Can we agree? Yeah. That was Whoa. interesting. As I say the word die, literally a light goes out. Like, that's, whoa, 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 that is be. amazing. That's an amazing prognostication, okay? The worst thing that can happen is that you die. Or maybe slightly less than that, that you almost die and you're stuck on ventilation for right. a very long time and you drain your family's resources, okay? Yep. That, now that we've just like embraced that that is the absolute worst that could happen, we can build in protective mechanisms from that one but there, there is like a universe of things that you do before you start putting yourself at risk for that. But being afraid to act, it is, it is the one and only thing that's just stupid. It's just stupid. Take an action. Figure it out. Don't be worried to embarrass yourself. Don't be afraid to go broke. Like, go for it. Okay? You can always rebuild your... Not even rebuild... 
You can always get back to where you are now, I promise. You can build more skills and get farther ahead. The only thing that is a waste of life is to hesitate. I have to stop myself from continuing because I just want to say it over and over and over. That's the only thing that scares me for people. That's good stuff. Good stuff right there. All right. If you're just joining us, we're on Facebook Live. This is After Impact. We're Partly discussing. In the dark. It's in getting the dark. a little dark in here. Um, we are discussing the episode with Layla Ali on Impact Theory, which was an awesome one. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, we got a comment on YouTube here. I just want to read some uh, from Jacqueline Lucian, who loved the episode. She says, authentic, wise, lovable, balanced, engaging, and inspiring. Layla Ali, everyone should read your story and hear this interview. I will return to listen to this interview when I need more clarity, strength, and direction. Nice. Grateful for you, and in addition, you are truly amazing and beautiful, spot on. Talented Tom, thank you. I look forward and will continue listening. You have a dedicated subscriber. Thank you, Jacqueline. Awesome. Thank you. It's amazing. All right, let's get into another question. This is from Kasim Ali. Sometimes it's helpful to find your inner gift and focus what is inside when someone is very close as Layla's father is. But if someone does not have what you should, what he should do in order to focus to find, this is a, I started reading this before reading this. Um, what are some of the takeaways you got from the Layla Ali episode? Let's, <laughs> let's just go there. Let's just go there. Um, I'm sorry, Kasim. I don't quite follow the question. But All right. um, if you could put in the comments what, what you're trying to say, we'll get to it. Okay, so what are some takeaways? So building a champion's mindset is very possible. And I, if I remember right, she said... Get a team around you. I loved oh, that, yeah. that that was the beginning of her answer. And that is something that's so important to me. And so I, did I ever tell you I didn't get my driver's license until I was 16 and a half? No. The reason I didn't get my driver's license was I knew as soon as I get my driver's license, I'll no longer spend the night at my friend's house. And I so enjoyed that phase of my life of like going to your friends, your parents drop you off, you're there all night. Like you feel sort of stuck, but in the limitation is the joy and all that. And I thought, as soon as I get that, I'm never going to stay the night at someone else's house because it's never convenient. Mm -hmm. It's never as comfortable. Mm -hmm. So if, well, I would just drive home. So I was so hyper aware of moving from phase to phase to phase. So I bring that up because team is like one of the greatest joys of my life. And I am so grateful for the phase that we're in right now at Impact Theory where it is... It's a small team. Everyone is pointed in the same direction. We're fucking excited. Things are moving fast. People from the outside now are looking in going, how are you guys doing this so fast, right? Yeah. Like now I'm hearing that over and over and over. And my answer is always the same. When you have a small group of dedicated people who are talented beyond measure, every single one of them plays like a linchpin. You have a culture of self-improvement, of working together as a team, like magical shit happens. So for her to say that the champion's mindset to get there starts with surrounding yourself with those people, like that resonated with me so much. And my wife was my initial team member and the person that held me to a standard and pushed me to be better. And like, I routinely think it makes me laugh. People think we're so crazy because this company is dead split down the middle, 50, 50, her and I, like it is a legal, like fucking nightmare. And, but like, I, I, promise you no matter what happens like that will never be an issue because like she's earned her half right I've earned my half like it is like that's just an understanding that we have and so team 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 I just can't say it enough selection matters and getting a team together but get a team together with that growth mindset that are pushing that know what they're trying to accomplish they're working together they have different roles so they're not overlapping trying to be the same thing that's critical. Um, she talked about fighting through the moments of weakness where you doubt yourself and then just acquiring the skills, like actually getting good at something, actually putting in the work, showing up in the gym every day and boxing, 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 like getting to the fundamentals. And like those three things to me are just so potent and powerful. And she just boom, boom. She, and you could tell like she never really thought about it before. So that was just her going, what did I do? Mm -hmm. And it, they are so on the money like that was one of the, the best things for me. I, I made a whole list, but those are like the three and I sent you the list. So you might actually have it, but 
those were the got a few here. like three sort of key things or the one broken into three things that really hit me. Nice. All right, I have a question. So you make a distinction in the episode between talent and early wins. Yeah. So can you explain why that difference is important to you and how do you identify early wins? Yeah, so um, talent, I think you get to through just a metric ton of grit and hard work. Um, so you can develop talent. Like I am a talented speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not born a talented speaker. So, but I got early wins in speaking, meaning like everyone tries to find their dynamic in the family and I could make people laugh. And because I could make people laugh, like I would, let's say I tried it one day and oh wow, I got a chuckle or a smile or whatever. And then by the end of high school, I could make people cry like mm -hmm. in laughter. And, but that wasn't that initial reaction. It's not like I was so funny out of the womb, people just like, you know, falling over themselves. So it really started with an early win. You get the smile, you get the chuckle, and then you start to develop it and practice it and put in the hours and you can develop that into a talent. So take somebody who's um, gifted at a sport, right? So maybe, and the, the study that they did on this, the number of hockey play, professional hockey players born from, I think it's January through March, it's like two thirds of all professional hockey players were born in those three months. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the way the Canadian school system works, those kids end up being the oldest people in their class. And so they're just at that age, it makes a big difference to be six or eight months older than everybody else. So now you're bigger, you're stronger, um, you're more coordinated, you're a little more mature. And so you play better against the people who are supposedly your age. So the coaches are like, whoa, this kid's really good. They gravitate towards you, they give you more attention, you get more praise, you score more goals, you get more confidence, people pay more attention to you, maybe you get better coaching. So it becomes this like self-fulfilling prophecy, right? But it just started with the lucky break of being a little bit older, a little bit stronger. So you get somebody who, like one of the, if I'm not mistaken, one of the things that makes for a great sprinter is the ability to relax your hamstring faster than normal, okay? And that's the thing that like holds people back. So imagine that you're just a little bit, whatever, genetically, you're a little bit better at relaxing your hamstring. Now, if you don't put in the work, you're never gonna be a world-class runner, but you get that early win, right? Where you're a little bit faster than the people in your class. And so, hey, that felt good. And so you wanna do it more. So anyway, that's the difference between an early win and a talent. Um, it's very important. And I think that people end up in random, random careers because they had a weird early win. Mm -hmm. Like when I think about, I almost became a stand-up comedian. And if it weren't for Mitch Hedberg, literally I would be, I think I'd be one of the greatest, of course, because anything I apply myself to, <laughs> um, but that I almost was a stand-up comic and because I got early wins in it. And why Mitch Hedberg? Haven't I told this story before? Yeah, I think so, but for our audience. For just let yeah. them, uh, this is. Because I'm a big fan of Mitch Hedberg. Yeah, this too. was one yeah. of my favorite stories. So, uh, graduate college, assume I'm gonna get the three picture deal. I crash and burn my senior year in college, and literally, I felt like my whole life was going up in smoke. And now I had, I was lost. I did not know where I was gonna go, what I was gonna do. And in those moments where you're dazed, you grab for the person's legs, right? That's what they teach you in <laughs> MMA. And so, my version of grabbing the legs was to go back to comedy, which is what I always assumed assumed my career was going to be anyway. And it wasn't until I went to college that I decided, you know what, I want to take myself a little more seriously. Like I'm actually passionate about the art of cinema and always being funny because I used a very self-deprecating style of humor. And so you're just reinforcing all this negative shit about yourself. And it gets a lot of laughs. It's very funny. And it actually wasn't corrosive to me, but it stopped me from thinking of myself as somebody who could build up and get better because I was just thinking about how funny it was that I was the way that I was, right? Yeah. Um, so in grabbing for those legs, going back to comedy when I just couldn't figure out what my life was gonna be or how I was ever gonna break into filmmaking. Um, I went back on stage, I actually performed at the Laugh Factory uh, on open mic and um, it is fascinating what happens in open mic. So a bunch of random people come up, they do comedy, they're almost universally terrible. And so the audience who's there primarily to see the person that they came with, starts at like maybe 350 people or whatever and it dwindles down to nothing. And by the time the, um, the open mic people come, like really big names come, but to try out new material. So um, Kim Wayans was there that night. I think there mm. was another big name. And, but it was just like, they were waffling on. It was terrible. And so finally I'm like, okay, I can't take any more of this. Like we gotta get out of here. So I tap my friend and I'm like, hey, you know, let's, get, let's leave. And this guy comes on and he's like, 
hey, everybody. They're, literally, I'm not kidding. There was like 15 people maybe left in the audience and two of us were getting up to leave. And the guy comes on and goes, the man who is about to come out is the funniest man in America. You're going to want to see him. I promise you it's going to be worth staying for this. And so I'm like, how do you leave yeah. like a we're being called out now and just B, curious. like yeah. now i'm curious so we sit back down the guy's like i had never heard of him but the guy's like hey everybody mitch hedberg and this guy comes out and he's got like these sunglasses on inside and he keeps closing his eyes and i'm like who is this guy like doesn't seem like he's gonna be very funny and then you know Mitch, right? Yeah. So unfortunately, Mitch has since passed away, but you guys should all do yourself a favor and look this guy up. He is the funniest comedian to ever walk the earth. And he does this, um, every joke is very simple. It's a setup and a knockdown. Will mm -hmm. you do one for us? <laughs> I, I, can't. I know you're on the spot, dude, but come on. Like he's um, got this vocal pattern. So one of my favorite Mitch Hedberg jokes is, um, uh, he says, I'm, I, I mumble a lot. He says, I, I mumble a lot, but I also stay, say a lot of stupid shit. He's like, so I'm walking down the street with my friend, and I'm mumbling. And he says, what? And I say it again, and he says, what? And he said, and pretty soon, I'm yelling, that tree is far away. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. So it's shit like that. It is like, they're so dead simple, but he does them one after the other, after the other, after the other. And he's got this like just intriguing vocal pattern and like word choice. I remember him saying, must I dial them all? Like it was like, just, I was in hysterics. So anyway, midway through a set and trust me when I say, we are not doing Mitch Hedberg justice no, right now. You no, want to no. go just <laughs> drop him into YouTube. I'm laughing so hard in the middle of his set. Tears are streaming down my face. That's whatever. I now go into like another place where I actually ask myself, as I am gasping for air, can you laugh until you die? And I was actually worried that if he like hit another one that was too fucking funny, that I may actually pass away in the fucking audience. <laughs> and so I'm like, this is funny. Yeah. What I did was humorous. This is funny. And I knew enough at that moment to go, I could get that good, but I would have to dedicate my life to it. I would have to get rid of the film thing. I would have to do stand-up comedy all day, every day, day and night. I would have to tour. Like, that would be it. Nothing could exist in my life but that. And I just wasn't prepared to do it. I didn't yeah. love it as much as I love film. So it just didn't make sense. But because I saw what greatness really was, I could ask myself, am I willing to put in the work to get that good? And the answer was no. And so, right But just because you didn't have the passion for it. Yeah, just because, I didn't have yeah. the passion. Not, and truly, I actually, I have the arrogance of belief. I believed, even then, I could get that good. But it just became so clear, the gap between where I was and where he was. Until that moment, I was delusional enough to think that I was like a couple weeks out, right? Yeah. Like if I just got yeah. up and I did it, you know, like- one little, yeah. a little bit of traction, you'd be good, yeah. Be all good. <laughs> and then I saw him and I was like, yeah, there, there is a, a universe between us and that universe is vast. So didn't have the passion to do it. Well, I didn't see Mitch Hedberg coming up in this oh, episode I? of After Impact, oh, but I? it was an interesting story. And fortunately, we have to wrap. So I want to thank everyone from Facebook Live for joining us today. And uh, I also want to give three takeaways from this episode, if you haven't seen it, that I think should inspire you to go watch it or listen to it on the podcast. So the first is, we didn't even get to talk about this, but it's a good story. Get better, not bitter. Yeah. Get better, not bitter. That is from Layla Ali herself. I think it's a great idea. Um, the second is you can be that great and still not be perfect. So don't worry about the things that you're struggling at. Only focus on the thing you're passionate about and get really good at that. And the last is just very simple. No excuses. No excuses. That's Indeed. it. You have the flu. Okay. Well, don't sit down in your corner because if you sit down, you're not going to get back up. No excuses. I love that. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Layla blew me away. This one was awesome. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did. And if you haven't already subscribed, be sure to do so. It is a weekly show. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care.